We are in Champions League, man. That was my Dilly din, dilly dong, come on. Ancara Messi, 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 Ancara Messi,
that, that recreates what they are now. And I think the only things that I can think of that lead me to where I was, I know that where I grew up, there was a football field out in the back garden that had, uh, in, the, in the neighbourhood, that had trees at either end. So we would go out and play in the whole neighbourhood. There was there were six of us that would go out and play. It's the whole neighbourhood, six of us. Grew up in the village. Um, and it was myself, I was the oldest, and one other old boy. And we would always be on the same team, the two of us. And we'd play against the four young kids. And we had this... It, it was a verbal rule that we couldn't score an ugly goal, the two of us. It had to be a beautiful goal. The young kids could score any way they wanted. And that was, I think that sort of, <laughs> in a Dan Machisi style way, and I was listening to him talking about how he did that with his, not, not that particular rule, but would set rules on certain players and play numbers down with older boys. That led to my mindset, I think, being one where I felt like I always needed to be significant and involved as a player. So as a centre-back at school, I'd wear the number 10 shirt, take every set piece, put the captain's armband on. I always wanted to be involved and around play. And you could call that egotistical if you want. But I think for me, it was more wanting to be involved and be a ball player and, and have some sort of role um, in the team that was far from cautious and vigilant. Um, so that led to more of a possession-focused way of thinking, I think. Um, and then there was a light bulb moment. I'm a card. I'm from Cardiff, um, and I was at a Cardiff game. We were watching Swansea in the Championship. It was a game that Cardiff actually won. I think Craig Bellamy scored. But I'm watching the game, and I swear now we didn't touch the ball the whole game. Swansea had the ball the whole time, and I, and I've never been more envious of a team that I hated so much as a as a young teenager. Um, we got pelted with, on the head with coins when Bellamy scored. My head was bleeding after the game. It was, it was, it's that sort of rivalry at Cardiff and Swansea. Um, obviously now no longer that way and kind as a fan. Not to say I was chucking coins or anything, but I'd certainly stand next to the away fans and get right up in the atmosphere. Um, and that that moment, I remember reflecting on that game, thinking that is how I wish my team played. Um, and that's going to get some hatred, I'm sure, by my family members who are all Cardiff fans. But that, that, that was a moment. And then I went to university, studied architecture at university. And uh, while doing that, I worked uh, at Soccer Tots. I don't know if you have that over here. Yeah, we do, yeah. You do? Okay. So yeah. that's normally in, in church halls and um, sort of leisure center halls. So I was doing Soccer Tots, which is obviously very skill-based and fun and often to music. Um not sure it fitted with my personality as a 21-year-old, but it was much better doing that than bar work while at university. Uh, so I, I think that that sort of led me to a moment where I wanted to study Barcelona and the style of play because um, that marries together this, this world of possession and skill. And that led me to just this crazy study. I just started emailing people and desperate to speak to anyone who had some sort of possession focus. And the first person who wrote back uh, was Chris Davis, who was Brendan Rodgers' assistant at the time. Um, or maybe he was head of analysis at Swansea, so he's now the assistant at Celtic. He, uh, he sort of gave me an open eye into the world of his work and uh, d developing a possession-style play. Um, and then another person wrote back, John Collins, who was studying a PhD in Spanish training methodology. He worked at the University of Oxford. Um, and I ended up working with him. Uh, went to the University of Oxford to work with him. And got an amazing insight into Spanish training methodology, and, and that whole research project. I think I don't I don't know if you remember the time, guy. I had a website where I had a members area where I'd share all these resources. I know it's sort of frowned upon nowadays mm -hmm, to, mm -hmm. to share everyone else's content, but that that then led to people like Tim Lees, Louis Lancaster, um, James Nash, who who is Dan Machici's. Uh, I mean, he would consider Dan Machici's someone that he models himself on. He worked at MK Dons at the time. He lists Paul Holder as, a, as, a, as someone who he would consider a mentor as well. Um, those three reached out, and that's really shaped my way of thinking. James Nash, amazing man. Like, I'm listening to Dan Matisse's talk on your podcast every day, and there's so much similarity between the two of them, um, as you'd expect. They, they sort of rode that journey together at MK Dons. Um, but yeah, th those, those components and just getting a different eye into the worlds of different ways of thinking. Louis Lancaster, very, and our conversation was always about athlete-centred development back then. Uh, Tim Lees was always talking about how to theorise football and think about receiving and different receiving scenarios. Nashi was talking about coaching individuals. Uh, and then Nashi introduced me to a guy called Sanjeev Palmer, who I work with in Canada now, um, who 
in all my years of football, other than Marcel Lucassen, would be considered by me as one of the greatest technical developers and just thinks about the details and the technique to a level I've never even imagined was possible. Mm. Um, so I think that's where my philosophies come from, football philosophy, if you want to call it that, but just getting the different insights and stealing what I can from everyone who I would consider an expert in different ways of thinking. I'm not sure that's the best answer, but that's that would be the journey and, and that where I'm now with, with, with my way of thinking. Yeah, it's very interesting because I wouldn't have put soccer tots as as part of your journey and, and that like working at you, that type of development. I would say, you, had you answered without knowing anything about you and just knowing where you are at the minute and seeing um, the books and everything behind the work you've done, I would have said he was up... 14 hours a day playing champ manager, looking at tactical systems. Um, <laughs> but it's almost a different way of getting there, isn't it? I mean, championship manager certainly played a role between the age of 11. <laughs> and so, and my mum used to call it the list game. She'd walk into my room and there'd be lists of players' names everywhere. So, yeah, the list game played a role for sure. Brilliant. Um, your book on Bielsa, sort of conversation it generates amongst coaches, at college coaches standing around fields. Um, Huge, huge. He's become a trendy figure in coaching. So I'm, I'm curious to, to get your insight if you think or you feel that, that in, in writing the book and the detail that you go to write the book and the detail that it touches on, even without the research, the detail you go into tactically, uh, do you think some coaches skip the detail and are, and are looking just for the sessions? Uh, do you know what's funny? I, that, that book actually got rejected by a publisher for having not getting straight enough to the point and having enough coaching um the bit that you imagine everyone skips to uh, mm. it, it wanted more of that and less of the story of how the how I got to the knowledge I had or the journey of learning and and as you know me Gary like that's not why I would write a book but um yeah, and I'm sure there are people who do that, but I really hope that, that that's not the In fact, anyone buying my book, I would say the, the least developed part of it or the least the part that I'm least connected with and flick to least is the uh, is the session part at the end. Um, and I put it right at the end. But I, I put it at the end because I think it's necessary to, to see how certain ideas could be developed because that's always the argument people have when they say, oh, perfect theory, but how do you do this? Um yeah, I mean, I, I know that people would do that, but but the, the most important bit for me uh, in that book is, is looking at, there's there's a part in it and there's a research bit I did um, on key performance indicators and, and seeing how Bielsa develops individuals. Uh, he's often doing unopposed practices with his players or, or, or one-to-one practices with his players to develop habits. And uh, I spoke to Mark Sampson who at the time was England women's manager, and he, he talked about something called individual goal trees, um, which is sort of a global simplification to promote nonverbal communication around key ideas. And uh, basically, it, it's to, give in, to work from individuals outwards um, to get implementation of a global tactical idea. Um, he had sort of individual goal trees. He'd give every single player, um, and, and this is... Uh, it wasn't something Mark did before he went to England. So I imagine this is something that they do at the England's, uh, certainly within the women's camp. I know they get all the expertise from different pl- different places, the business world they're bringing and get they reform their language based on their conversations. Um, so the, the, the individual goal trees is basically they give each player an attacking objective and a defending objective. So if you're a striker, you're attacking, and they're playing 4 4 2, just for simplicity of this conversation. Um, you're a striker and I'm a striker. Your piece of paper and your conversation with the manager would be, uh, Gary, we want you to drop between lines and try and link up play and connect and get on the ball between lines. Think about all your movement of how you lose your defender to get turned and get between lines. That's your attacking goal tree. Um, my attacking goal tree, as, a, as your partner striker, without knowing what yours has got, my attacking goal tree is about making movement in behind to be clever with my movement and try and get in behind the opposition defence. So... Every individual on the team would have an attacking goal tree, an attacking one and a, and a defending one. And I wouldn't know what yours said, you wouldn't know what mine said. So I'd have the conversation with the staff and get my piece of paper and then we'd meet up in the unit. So I would meet you and we would discuss how we would help each other out and cooperate on the field. So you achieve your goal tree and I would achieve mine. Obviously what's happened here is that they've been put together to 
mutually benefit each other. So you're dropping between and I'm showing, you know, one striker's going, one striker's coming uh, between lines, showing and going. And that relationship's already been thought about from a global perspective by the people who design the goal trees. But you and I don't know that. We're, we're getting the information at the, the grassroots level. Then we meet and we decide how we're going to cooperate. So you and I would meet. And then we would meet with the wingers and, and find out how they were going to cooperate. One winger might be told that he's got to try and clip balls in behind or play the balls between lines. For, I, I'm, I'm not, that's not an exact example, but just to highlight the example around relationship building, the, the model would end up coming together. So once I meet the wingers, then we'd meet the fullbacks, then we'd meet the centre mids and everyone would meet everyone. Uh, we'd all come together and we'd come up with our tactical plan ourselves as players um, Whereas in reality, that's not what's really happened. We've we've spoken about how we're going to help each other out and get nonverbal communication that's already been designed from a higher level. Um, so I, I I like to think of that, and and that's the big part of I think about how you develop tactics is, is starting with the individual. Uh, you might have the framework in mind from a much higher level, but explaining things from that higher level to players isn't always the most beneficial way of doing it. And I know that when you watch Bielsa's training sessions, they're often individual. Uh, unopposed practices, he'll call defenders in one minute and then midfielders in the next minute. And they, I remember when he was in France, they would say that we wouldn't even see the attackers till the end of the week, um, the defending unit. But but that's what's happening there. Um, exactly the same ideas. And I think it's this idea of local interactions, individuals giving rise to, to global patterns on a team level. Um, I think it was German coach Nagelsmann. Oh, I apologise if I butchered that name, but... He had a quote where it was something along the lines of, um, I get all the ingredients. I think it was, I consider myself a baker. I get all the ingredients, I put it in the oven, and I see what comes out. And I think that's that, for me, is an amazing way to think about tactical control and design. And, and if you go through YouTube and look at Bielsa's training sessions, you'll often see just unopposed, irrelevant work happening. But I... I I know that it's designed around a way that it all comes together. Um, So, yeah, I hope that anyone reading the book, that's the main bit they get out of it. Uh, I'm sure it's not highlighted as much as I've highlighted it there, but that's the bit that that switched me on the most. Mm. It's almost a paradox with understanding tactical systems that it's about individuals first then. And Mm. and we want to be like, we, we love the tactics board as coaches, don't we? But it's really about every piece in that board and maximizing every piece and, why do you think we're reluctant to, to do that as coaches? I'm not sure. I mean, I've had this dilemma myself where I've been working within uh, this idea of using a diamond um, in certain areas of the field and coming up with different ways to use the diamond uh, from a global level. Um, so maybe it might be that you will get into the top of the diamond and you, you've got set priorities. You want the guy to turn or set the ball back or, or run in behind. Um, and I think it's much easier to explain it from that level then start to break it down in terms of, okay, what are all the individual's movement patterns? Um, what are all the individual techniques that are involved in this, potential techniques? What are all the decisions that are involved in this? What's the global communication between everyone involved in this? Not within the diamond, but also outside of the diamond on the opposite side of the field. And I think it's much easier to explain all the knowledge once you have it than it is to start from the bottom and let things grow a little bit more naturally. Uh, to plant the seeds, let it grow. And then because you have that knowledge of where it could go into the end, you're sort of observing it and guiding it a bit more. Um, Because at the end of the day, and I've watched this happen, if you start leading it from a black and white answers uh, perspective, and this is how we use the diamond, this is how we play here, you must make this pass, that pass, you must make this exact movement, I can guarantee, yes, you might get success, but it's going to break down 10, 11 times in a game, um, I, just, I, I mean, we'll sp- I'm sure, I, I hope at some point we'll get to speak about decision-making here, but I, I don't think players have that bird's-eye view in a football manager way or FIFA way mm. um, on the field. So I don't think it's right to talk about it in that way all the time. Sometimes it's a useful reference, but to, to talk about it all the time, I don't think it's the most useful way to think about tactics. And we all do. We all get the tactics board out and speak about it from that perspective quite a lot. Do you think it's somewhat ironic then that when a system fails... You know, the coaches, when it's not uh, performed or worked on or, or uh, committed at a, at, a, at a level of depth, the, the coach then just blames the players. Well, we didn't have the players to do that. It's easy for Guardiola. But then 
we've seen here the last week, Bielsa has taken the Leeds job. So maybe success or failure there, it almost says that he doesn't feel that you need world-class players to be a world-class coach. I, th I think I saw, I tried to follow his, uh, I'm, I'm sure you watched it, the, the, the press interview. Um, and I was expecting maybe they'd bring in a number of players, but I think they've come forward and said, we're not going to sign a lot of players this year. We're going to work with what we've got. We're going to make the squad even smaller than what it is. And he's valuing things like intelligence and um, capacity to learn, I'd imagine, of being there. So I think there's a real trust in your work that you can help players get there. But for that to happen, you have to uh, accept that players are humans and they're not going to be perfect. And I, the Bielsa's big famous quote about players, not uh, if all players were robots, he'd be the best in the world or whatever it is. Um, I think what he's really saying is that players aren't robots and you have to establish that. Um, and therefore, everything in between is the important bit. Let's talk World Cup then. Your role with the Iranian national team, where you produce the opposition analysis. Yeah, so uh, I've done a little bit of work before as a consultant for them back in 2015 in the Asian Cup. I think it was late 2014, actually. Um, and then and then this time, uh, reached out to me. Their, their staff is very uh, mixed nationality. So obviously, Carlos is Portuguese. Uh, Mick McDermott is Irish. Great guy, Mick McDermott. Um, their assistant, who's just left, was American, I think. Um, who left just before the World Cup. So it, it, I know everyone always thinks, that, how, how has that happened in Iran? That's the most random involvement in football I've seen but the reality is football is a global game so all the staff is from different parts of the world um, and my role was to basically look at the opponent and uh, sort of propose a game model um, around knowing that what we would be about um, so merging together our identity with the potential opposition identity and therefore what would the game look like and then analyse the important bits from that moment so with Spain, it would be looking at how they switch the ball, looking at how they get in behind, um, I, outlining the triggers for runs, outlining what they do in transition, and then um, coming up with a game model that, that, that makes them uncomfortable in those moments. So that, that was my role within there, within that. What's the time and depth involved in, in breaking the game down? I mean... How many times do you watch it? Do you need a certain camera angle? Do you create individual profiles, key relationships? I mean, what does your room look like whenever that's going on? Uh, yeah, my room. Uh, <laughs> if my mum walks in today, she'd probably uh, it'd still be called the list room. But <laughs> there's, uh, yeah, there's a bit of everything going on. There'd be some individual profiling, looking at, for example, Spain again, Isco, um, his dominance on one foot and his tendencies. So that's on the individual level. And then on, on the higher level, the overall team shape. Um, so I think you zoom from those two lenses. In the ideal world, you're watching it in the stadium. You're, you're, you're watching it from a bird's eye view camera lens. Uh, you're possibly watching a training session and get some idea of, you know, whatever's possible there. But uh, for this particular case, it was all done on Scout. So I was watching it from the TV camera angles. Um, with the context of speaking to people who have been involved in the Spanish education, um, just from contacts I've had over the years, getting an idea of what they think. So one of the things they, they one of the Spanish educators said, um, it was interesting, he said that, well, PK doesn't need a reference and Ramos does need a reference. So I was like, well, what do you mean by that? Um, and he was saying that PK can play freely with many different decisions in front of him. This is the consensus in Spain from the coach. Whereas Ramos needs a set of structure in front of him, a, a familiar structure in front of him. So that was an interesting comment. And then I would watch the game with that, with that being said by someone who knows the players for a lifelong education. Um, so, yeah, that was an individual. It, it's done on many layers. And, and then what's presented eventually is just the important stuff. So... You know, maybe you're not doing every individual, but you're certainly looking at some individual profiles. You're looking at certain moments of the game. You're looking at just the global understanding of what the formation looks like in different moments. Uh, the tendencies of, of all the players. Yeah, it's got to be of everything, but but you, I guess you put together the important stuff that backs up your suggest your proposal for the for the game. Hmm. Just talking on that, and and especially with with Iran, and you're preparing for teams like Spain and Portugal. Uh, that that you don't possess the same amount of firepower slash talent as they do. How how difficult is it just in general to prepare defensively without being marked as a defensive team, so to speak? 
I, th- I think, do you know what I think defending is? So we look at the World Cup now and I think organisation of teams are vastly improving and how they protect the middle of the field and how they take away space and restrict the space even quicker than before. Um, and I think defending nowadays has become, certainly with the international setup, so defending is often about clear rules, clearly defined rules, logical logical explanations for why certain things were done. Um, and this is where the difference in formations truly exists and how you defend, uh, who presses where. How, it, it, there's a, I think it's more pattern-based. Whereas attacking, certainly at international level again, I think is, is less... Uh, Attacking needs to become more sophisticated. Attacking in the international level, but I think attacking is less as less planned, given the contact hours you have with the with the players. Um, but from a defensive point of view, that, that that's where the game can be very quickly accelerated in a team team level, and I think that that's the that's the most important part from the international perspective. A World Cup like this is making sure you get the defending right, uh, and. I saw last night, I think I retweeted it, there was a diagram by Impact who showed the number of times teams had been penetrated. Uh, the number of passes, and I think they've called it suffered bypass defenders. So uh, what their terminology means is the number of times their players, the opposition has played through your lines and how many players they've passed by. Uh, and Iran, I think, were... Pretty well, I think they were the second best team in terms of letting these balls past them. Uh, I think France were top, and then it was Iran. Uh, obviously, Iran didn't have the same capacity as your Belgians and, and uh, other teams like that going forward. But I mean, that's quite a remarkable stat. And 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 Iran by no means have any superstars in the same way most countries do. And I think there was even a a picture of fans in the stadium holding a sign saying, we might not have Ronaldo's and Messi's, but we've got a giant heart and we work hard. Mm. Uh, I mean, that was the, the message given. And I told you, I spoke to you informally before, but I was I was in a bar watching this in Ottawa. Uh, I just walked into a bar that I'd been to before and I look around and everyone is Iranian. I was like, whoa, I, this is spooky. I don't know what's happened here. Uh, and I go sit down and someone comes up to me before the game says, are you supporting Spain? I was like, no, no, Iran. And he couldn't get his head around it. And I told him why. And I didn't have to buy myself a drink. I was in there. All the Iranians were jumping around. There's a guy with a horn sat next to me. Um, they're celebrating every clearance, every tackle, every save, every shot over the crossbar. Everything has been celebrated like a goal. I was like, this is amazing. Uh, and then uh, when we scored, it was disallowed. But when we scored, that free kick routine, having two players over the ball when, it, when Spain had a high line, was something I'd outlined. So I was really excited by the free kick. Uh, and I recorded it, and the place went crazy. Like, the guy with the horn jumped on me. It was the most passionate. And I was just like, this is the most amazing experience I've ever had watching a game. Um, so that, I think having a nation of passionate people who are willing to celebrate the dirty side of the game mm. certainly helps how you're going to play, because I think if England were to set up that way, given the stature, you'd get a very different response in a bar. You'd be hearing a lot of different language uh, let's put it that way. <laughs> Brilliant. But, but yeah, I, th- I think that, that that helps the attack uh, defending side. Whereas the attacking side, I think, and, and again, well, well Mick, Michael Beale was on your podcast recently, and I spoke to him about how he worked with the under 21s at Liverpool at some point. And he said, look, at Liverpool, we had an op- at the time, they had an open door group. So that, what that meant was players were going on loan, they were with the first team, they were going down an age group. He never had the same core of players together. Very much at an international level, you, you very rarely got those players together. So I said to Mike, I said, Mick, how, how do you work on tactics? Like, how is it possible you can work on this non-verbal communication with players if you're not together very often? And all you're doing is individual work, because that, that was his big message at the time. And I'm sure still is. He's brilliant at it. Uh, and what he said was, well, we play 4-3-3. But the hat of the team changes depending on who the profiles are because you never know which, which players are going to get. And it, I think Mick at the time was the attacking coach as well. They had different coaches for different units. And he said, well, there's six different hats. So you can have balanced, which means you've got two wingers and a striker. You can have one balanced, one inverted winger. And then, so that means you've got one winger out wide and one winger who cuts inside and a striker. You could have two inverted wingers and a striker. So two players that are to running behind and the wing rolls. You might have two wide number 10s in a striker. You could have a false nine and two inside forwards. You could have random and free movement from the front three. And I think what, what he's tried to do, um, 
and I, and I'll say this, giving Mick all the credit. I think he's trying to come up with a non-verbal communication uh, simplification of how they want to play. So, regardless, I mean, you look at the profile of the player ahead of you, and you know we're going to play this way uh, because that's Harry Wilson, and Harry Wilson does this, or we're going to play this way because that's this player, and he does this. Um, and I think that is an amazing starting point. And I think that's how national teams, to some, not all of them, obviously, but to some degree, work. Uh, you'll get the the players in, and you'll start to form it off a loose framework based on who the players are. Um, I think, you know, I, I can't speak for all national teams, but that's certainly a way that you could very quickly build a, a sophisticated attack. So moving on then to decision-making. Very basic question, but a big one at the same time, especially here in the US. How can we create better decision-makers? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I'm glad we were speaking about this. Uh, I mentioned earlier, I hope we speak about decision-making, but the... Um, the idea of decision making is sort of a bit of a, certainly with some people you speak to, a bit of a blurry word and what it really means. Sort of like the word creativity or like the word, you know, what, what is it really? Um, I, I had that problem a few years back. And, and I, you know, given that I was speaking to James Nash, who was very much about, you know, the Dan Matisse style, creativity and decision making was a big thing. Uh, working on a 60 by 40 field with 11 by 11 and, and, and making it very tight. And then you'd work with, so I'd speak to someone else who was all about positioning and making sure it was relevant to the, the position, the spacing you would have on 11 by 11 field and getting everything right about that um, in relation to decision making. And, and there's a great book by Gary Klein. I forget which one it is now, but there's, there's two he's written. One's called In Streetlights and Shadow. Oh, sorry. In, yeah, Streetlights and Shadows. I apologize if I'm getting the names wrong. And the other, it was his book that he wrote in the late 90s, is the one that has this in. I forget the name of it right now, but he spoke about decision making and he was looking at firefighters and pilots and different people who make complex decisions. And he said, well, there's two ways of thinking about it. Well, the way they, they theorized decision making before was that you'd have, let's just say for the purposes of this conversation, that a, 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 a pilot has 12 options in this moment or a firefighter has, and it was firefighters who were studying, 12 options. Uh, your, your house is burning down, you're standing in front of a house. Okay, these are my 12 options. Let's go through them. One leads to this, two leads to this, three. Okay, three is a 90% good answer. Four, four is 100%. Let's go with four because four is the best one. Uh, and that's optimizing your decision making. You're sort of seeing your options and picking the most optimal one. Um, what they found, unfortunately, was just, uh, unfortunately, I say that because that's not what they wanted to find. They, they, did, they wanted to find that, sorry, but they didn't find what, um, didn't find that. What they found were that they, they were coming up against firefighters who were saying to them in their reflections, I don't make decisions. And they're like, well, what do you mean you don't make decisions? And they were saying, well, we just respond. We just act. Um, and, and the theory he came up with is called recognition prime decision making. And what they said was, you know the goal of the situation, put out the fire, make sure no one dies, um, including yourself, including everyone in the house, rescue as many people as you can. So that's the goal in this, largely speaking, uh, situation. Um, so there's the goal. And then you go to the first, you, you go to an option. Yeah, that satisfies the goal. That's the solution. Like you don't then go and continue evaluating others. The one that satisfies the goal of the moment is the one you do. The first one you see that satisfies the goal of the moment. Um, so with that in mind, when you think about football and decision-making in football, um, and I should say this was a decision-making model they said fits 80% of decisions. So it's not 100%. This isn't all the decision-making. Um, with that in mind, so knowing your specific goal for the situation and seeing the first option that fits that description being what they define as decision-making, then, then I think you can start to think about decision-making in a certain way in football. So I met a coach called Arthur Brammer lately from Fulham. Brilliant guy. Uh, I think he's left Fulham now. He's in the US. But Arthur Brammer, when he was coaching and he came into the club I'm at now, he was doing a session, he kept talking about ABC. And that meant angle, body shape, checking. But I think if you take the first two components of ABC, angle and body shape, well, really there you're talking about orientation. You know, how's your body set up? And then checking what you're looking at. So that there, ABC, might look like it has nothing to do with decision making. But in reality, if we're saying that there's two components, one is knowing the goal for the situation, which, which comes through speaking about decision making and, and making this decision. well this is the goal for this moment this is the goal for that moment uh, and I think you can come up with a model to simplify that for players but the the seeing component well that's your angle your body shape and your checking 
And then I think if you can tie together the seeing and the the goal setting information, you've got something. Uh, so we come up with something uh, at the club I'm at, and, and it's in my book actually, and it's something I came up with uh, as a byproduct of studying Bielsa. Well, the the whole goal bit, um, what's the goal in this moment? Was to score a goal is always the best thing. Assist the goal is the next best thing. Put the ball into situations where we can assist. Next, after that, it's blurry. Like, what? What's the next best thing? We can talk about penetrating, taking numbers, taking players out of the game, which we spoke about earlier with the World Cup stat. Um, so penetrating. If you can't penetrate, there's a reason for it. Well, what are those three? What are those reasons? I've identified three. So that means the opposition are too compact ahead of you horizontally or vertically, or they have layers in their in the way. Uh, so those three reasons. So if you can't penetrate, then you, you're likely to switch the ball out of that area to a different area to penetrate from. And then if you can't switch or penetrate or score or any of the above, then you're looking to outplay that moment. That might be collective outplaying, which typically you think of your Barcelona Rondos, or it might be individual outplaying, which would be your skill work, opposed skill work. So if that's your goal setting uh, framework, hierarchies, then you want to tie together your checking. Well, if you're a midfielder waiting for a ball, the first direction that you need to make sure you check in, because if your principle is to score assists, set someone up or penetrate, is to look forwards. So forwards, the next direction, if you can't penetrate, as we spoke about, is to switch the area. So you're going to look over the opposite side of the field because you've, always got, you've already got vision of where the ball is. You already have vision of near. So forward opposite. And then near, you're already doing that. And then the last component of that is to communicate it. And that might be through your body language, through your angle, your body shape, through your verbal communication, through your movement. Uh, you might check away and come to, and your teammate knows you do that a lot. And therefore, in that moment, you're communicating, I want the ball to my feet. Um, and, and forward, opposite, near, communicate. That is a checking model, a seeing model that is in line with the goal model. So that, for me, is decision-making. They're right there. Um, so by controlling what they see, you then get, what you want on the field and I think that controlling what you see is very rarely spoken about everyone says check your shoulder well, ch check your, well, what in regards to what and the reality is that that what is well, what's the goal in the moment um, and the goal in the moment changes so in transition I've given my boys that I coach right now a rule that is can we make two quick passes in transition that's the goal just for that moment um, in other moments it's different but we're obviously in this utopian world where we want to keep the ball and keep possession and we do very well but that that's the rule and I think you would layer that rule around counter-attacking principles more at the professional level but that that rule that goal in that moment affects what you see and how you move and how you communicate and I haven't made that uh, that forward opposite near communicate thing I've, got, I've taken that from uh, Clive Woodward at England Rugby and he had a I think it was crossbar touchline communicate that was the that's how they were trying to help decision making in the rugby team obviously it's not as uh, it's not the same sport because you can't play forwards there um, so crossbar you're looking forwards touchline you're looking to the opposite touchline away from the ball and then you communicate and you're already looking near the ball so it's the same sort of idea um, and then the other part of decision making is you play the passes you can make um, so that might be psychologically you're not confident and therefore you're not going to try and make that 40 yard pass so you're not going to play that pass and that's your decision making you're not seeing that anymore because you know that you've you've made that up you might not have the technical ability to play that pass so now you're combining psychology and technique with decision making yet a lot of people separate them and never speak about them together um so you might have a player who's not making the right decisions what well, might actually be a psychology issue it might be a technical issue it might not necessarily be that he doesn't he can't make the decision he sees it, you know. Not everyone's got that that pass from John Stones into Harry Kane. Or, 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 sorry, England bias there, but that that pass in between lines that splits everyone. Not everyone has that in them. In terms of, you know, Guardiola always talks about bravery in his post match interview. In terms of having the balls, I think he said the bravery, the cojones, mm. um, and you might not have the technique for it. So you're not going to make that decision. So I, I think the decision making is so layered. But for me, I would attack it in the way I've spoken about. So then I'm moving on post game. How can we give players a better idea of, of how they gauge their performance with those decision-making variables rather than just saying, hey, you had a 98% pass completion? Yeah, I, th I think, that, again, going back to, and this would be something I would have done, but sitting down with the player one-to-one -one and, and A, making sure they understood the goal of a situation because that requires some sort of understanding in relation to the team model. 
and then B, assessing how they saw it. So looking at their angle and body shape and looking at their head movement. You know, where particularly did they look? Maybe they never looked over there. Maybe they didn't need to look there because they knew it was there. But identifying that and then, and again, speaking about what we spoke about, if they've not made the correct decision, well, then you need to start talking about, okay, or thinking about it at least. I might not express it uh, explicitly to the player, but the psychological state of the player, the game, the moment, and the technical ability of the player. Um, and his confidence with his technique to play it. And I think that it's a, that is a really, I mean, to, to assess decision-making then becomes a technical issue, a psychological issue, a tactical issue, a game insight issue. It becomes a bit of everything um, in all four corners, if you want to use the four-corner model or whatever model you use. But it, it, what I think is dangerous, so we're talking about post-match uh, analysis, um, I've made a lot of mistakes with post-match feedback. Uh Game day, so you have your game day, and this is something I've sort of started to theorize lately after going to my latest sort of World Football Academy pro course with Raymond Behind, who's a, a Dutch coach, a coach educator. Um, what Raymond Behind suggests is that, that in your week, you have three principles. Principle one is your recovery from a game. So game day is obviously the day it says Saturday. Sunday and, and Monday would be principle one. Well, typically it would be Principle one suggests a recovery day and an off day. Uh, principle two is the two days before the game. So now you're going to your, your Thursday, Friday. Those two days are your game, pre-game prep. Um, so those are the two days where you overload your decision-making and your, your non-verbal communication. And then principle three is in the middle of the week. And if, if you haven't got the middle of the week because you have a three-game week, then these are, this is the days you lose out. But principle three is, is your first day back after your day off, which would be a, a, an overload and emphasis on execution of decision-making. Um, and then, and then the day after that, an overload and emphasis on football fitness. Um, so if we look at that week and we're considering the brain as part of the body and the body needs the recovery day, the body needs now to a start up day to work on technique, the body needs a conditioning day, then so does the brain. Like the, the same thing. And there was a psychologist who did a presentation lately to something, uh, I saw and she was talking about, uh, stress, staying awake at late at night, not allowing you to recover. So if I'm if I'm calling players in in uh, Ottawa Fury and we've just come back from a twelve hour flight or, or a nine hour bus journey, um, and it's game day plus one and I'm doing this big post match presentation on players what we all did wrong, that's totally not in line with the model of periodization that we're using, and and if we're being if we're any way in respect uh, respecting in any way that the brain is part of the body and they're linked, then you shouldn't be doing that if that's the model you're using. So there's a model I came up with after after speaking to everyone, and what it, what it is is game day, and I've not applied this with professionals, and I, I've not explored it yet. But in the military or in the SAS, after they do an operation, they have something called an after action report, and that is led straight after the the uh, mission, and that isn't led by the the guys at the top. It's not led by the people who have the highest rank, and it's led by the people who actually did the mission you know the lowest ranking officers and and that's straight after it's normally objective it's normally okay well do we all understand what we were meant to do today did we achieve it it's it's set on a sort of structured way of talking about it so I, my thoughts and i've not done this yet would be straight after the game and you never see this i've never seen this a player-led discussion where coaches are there making notes and they're there making notes to just to double check that players fully understood the objective and players are totally on board because the reality is sometimes we speak to players like they were on board and they understood everything when they didn't um so that's one that's one component and i haven't it's not perfect that idea but there's, there's an idea there that I, we could take from that world and then the other thing the, the psychologist said well if you want players to sleep better after games um and i'm sure you're not gay players don't sleep after games sometimes um so they did there's, there's this idea that you can do personal private reflections and I think she was talking about journaling and how that would help players sleep better and settle their thoughts. I was like, that's a brilliant idea. I've never done that. Like having some sort of optional hand in survey. Uh, I haven't, again, not formalized it, but then they hand that to the, an, an, um, the analyst and it's in confidence and the analyst can see then, okay, I'm reviewing the game from this perspective. We were talking about psychology in relation to decision-making. If you don't have the full picture, how can you start to assess someone's decision-making if you don't understand their psychological state? So, that's something I've looked at. Then game day plus one. If we're saying it's recovery day and you're not emphasizing anything, you're not emphasizing communication, decision making, um, sorry, uh, communication, uh, just 
yeah, decision making, execution of decision or fitness. We're not emphasizing any of that. It's a recovery day for the players who played. Then there should be no emphasis in the video of or, or we're going to assess your communication or decision. There should just be an informal discussion. Pick the players of the brains, get on their level playing field, see what they felt about the game, and then it should be a brain recovery day. Then game day off, uh, game day plus two is off. Game day plus three, where we're coming in and we're working on touches and whatever it is you might do at the club, so where you emphasize emphasize and execution of decisions. Um, that should be when you sit down with players and start to analyze their decision making, you know, and their execution of the decision, uh, whether it's small groups, however you do it, however's right. Then the next day you're talking about football fitness, um, which is game day minus three or plus four, however your model works. Um, that should then be a day where they're about to go out and play within the context of the next opponent. You're showing a few clips of the next opponent. These are situations we're going to get in a lot and discussing it and then going out and playing. Right. And then game day minus two and game day minus one, where we're going to emphasize communication and decision making. Well, those are two brilliant days to then start assessing the overall team ideas. Uh, but I don't think many people have this this idea of thinking about how to, and I certainly didn't until lately, until I made the mistakes I did, thinking about how to program and periodize feedback uh, with the players in mind. Um, but yeah, I, I apologize if I've gone off track there in terms of thinking about um, post-game analysis, but I think that's how I started to think about post-game analysis now, and I hope I'm giving away, enough away there that people can go and take that and run with it a bit. Go on, go on back. Um, so... You have a reputation as a tactical coach, but you mentioned there Raymond Verheyen, whose work started as a fitness guru, um, which that's not meant in any disrespect. Can you talk about that relationship and what you've learned there? So Raymond Verheyen to me is the single-handed, and, and I say this in the most genuine way I can, the greatest coach educator I've ever experienced. Um and, and my education with Raymond has nothing to do with fitness. I mean, that's an area I have the least knowledge in, uh, fitness and strength and conditioning. Um, and I think that's the point. Raymond wants to sort of not separate that from the idea of coaching. He wants to bring it in and make sure coaches have that knowledge. And I say that I don't have great knowledge of it. I have some. It's just not at the level of uh, I'd feel comfortable working in that field myself um, yet. But I think that's the point. He, he, Raymond's vision is that, is a head coach who has knowledge of almost everything. And if you had this head coach who is also knowledgeable about, you know, body recovery and um, um, psychology and uh, massage, I mean, if you, the smaller your staff is, the less miscommunication there is amongst staff um, and, and the more expertise you can share. And I think that's it's a great way of thinking about getting a staff working together because often you'll see in the professional world, uh, the fitness guy, sorry, not even the fitness guy, the guy who comes in and says, right, this person can't train, is the most berated person uh, in the staff and, and not treated with the same way that the head coach or, or the assistant coach who's leading a different component is. Uh, and that's really unfortunate. And that does happen at a lot of clubs. And I think that's because of a lack of shared knowledge. Um, that comes for a number of different reasons, different, different educations, different... Uh, Expertise and language uh, creates a sort of alienation of your roles. Um, and I think Raymond wants to get rid of that. And the bit that I've taken most from Raymond, and uh, he won't mind me saying this, is his way of thinking about theory and creating theory and how to structure and simplify thoughts and ideas is um, like it's... I, I, the first time I witnessed it and watched how he thought about it and how he structured and theorized it, my life changed in that moment. This is like, it was a penny dropping moment where I was like, this is everything I need just to put a framework down and, and become 50 times better. Um, and it's a really nice moment to have. It's not often you get those moments where the whole world shatters beneath you and you go, I don't know anything. Uh, but that was a moment I had with him and it was bringing sort of clarity and direction in my studies. Um, and, and most recently, the thing, uh, thing that I've, I've taken from him is, is to start thinking about how to transfer knowledge from coaches to players. And there's obviously... We spoke about giving feedback a minute, a, a huge area for me. So Raymond Vahey and anyone who thinks he's a, and I know you said no respect, anyone who thinks he's a fitness guru or that's his role, doesn't know what he's about. I know he, he comes across on Twitter a certain way and provokes conversation and feedback. But I mean, I'm watching people on TV now commentating and going, oh, this player's not had the rest he needs or, or this player. Like Raymond has put his neck on the line in the way he has, whether people like it or not. And that conversation is now happening because of, 
the sort of controversy that's happened on social media. I think there's obviously other components as well, but the controversy of social media has has led to that conversation, at least within what we would consider uneducated people on TV, but some people would, um, having conversations about rest and, and conversations about how to periodize a program, um, which is brilliant for me. That's a real win. Uh, but as I said, my relationship with Raymond is strictly professional. I don't think I'd ever have sit and have a drink with him. But uh, as, a, as a mentor, as, as someone who would look at me and be the only person I truly know who would point me out and go, Jed, what you're talking about is utter shit, uh, is Raymond. And he would say it like that. You know, and, and it's a, I wouldn't want my mum to be educated by him because I think my mum's weak and frail at heart and I, I wouldn't want her to get upset. But, you know, I can sit there and take it. Like, I, if someone's going to single me out and tell me I'm shit and rinse me out to dry and everyone in the room agrees with this guy and I'm sitting there going, do you know what? I agree with what you're saying. What a great moment. What a yeah. great way. Like, you've just got this feedback and you're, you're wrong. It's an amazing moment. And I appreciate that moment. So I think that's why I have such a, 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 a good... Um, reflection of who Raymond is and how he relates to me. I'm absolutely fascinated by his way because I've heard I've heard about nothing but great reviews about people who have been on his course. Um, but then I've also heard that other side that he's you know it's intense. He's dismissive of people who maybe don't communicate their beliefs in a way that he would like it or don't share certain beliefs. But my challenge to to him. Uh, his way of thinking or maybe his way of educating would be that w- would be dismissive of people who don't share the same idea then would that not impact risk and creativity for young coaches i think i think that this this raymond does that when he's talking very particularly about objective thinking and staying objective uh, um he will then single you out and say well what is your idea objective or are you talking about something that, from experience that has no real backing um from that level, but from the art of coaching, which is a completely separate component from the way you deliver it, I, I think people would be surprised. I mean, I watched him work with under 12 players at Valencia, or under 17 players at Valencia, and he, he's different. You know, and he, he comes down to a level with under 12 players. It's more about implicit coaching and letting players come to it. So, I mean, the art of coaching is something that Raymond actually intentionally doesn't give too much detail on he's truly about building an objective framework so i think if you go to that course with the idea of oh i'm going to get all the answers i need to go how to do it you're not going to get that uh what you will get is everything that comes before that how um and you might not even get new answers but you'll get an even more solid way of explaining and thinking and talking about it and debating it and i think that that having that conversational structure and the way of uh logically explaining what you want because at the end of the day when you get to the professional world a player is going to pull you aside and disagree with you at some point 100 percent, you're going to get players who disagree with you and you're going to have that moment and if you're skilled in logically describing and, and getting people to agree with you like i mean i just see it as a case study for i'm watching him sometimes it's, it's not you know i'm not when he's having to go at me but sometimes i'm like okay well i wasn't completely sold on that that little discussion i just saw there but there are times where in the initial discussion, a, player's, a person's disagreeing with Raymond, I'm like, oh, I'm totally on this person's side. I'm sat there and watching him. I'm 100% on this person's side. Raymond's wrong. And then by the end of it, I'm like, no, Raymond's right. So, I mean, that watching that is an amazing process and, and reflecting on that. Um, so, I mean, listen, like Erica said, it's not going to be for everyone, everything. And I don't go to that course and take 100% of the information away and apply 100%. But I know I go on that course and it improves me like no other course has done. Mm. So, that, that's how I live it. Brilliant. Well, maybe I'll I'll get him. I'll try and get him on here. Or maybe maybe I'll I'll venture to the course just to experience it myself. But I've heard that is, and I think to be honest, I think that's the way. Like I feel that uh, most coach education has been outdated in terms of deliver, sit, receive, nod, and go and apply whatever you want on your own. I do think we need to be shifted in our behaviours in the learning environment to try and you know because that's the experience aspect, right? I think yeah, and, and and asking questions as well. I mean, the courses I've been on, you, you're almost you are allowed to ask questions, but there's only a certain point where you've you've annoyed the guy who's about to assess you later. Uh, <laughs> whereas Raymond, and, and he actually did this, and he won't, again he won't mind me saying he had this uh, the thing where he got this journalist in. He sat on stage and he said to the journalist, "Destroy me, destroy me. Like do whatever you can." And, and Raymond sat there, took it all, and just swept this guy up. So I mean, the, the the course is more like okay. Any questions you have, any opposing feed, any opposing opinion, you have, get it, get it out there, say it. 
but expect to have a ferocious conversation about it. It's not going to be, oh, yeah, you're right, and move on. Because this guy has done thousands of hours of research to come up with the ideas he has. So if you're going to convince him and change his mind, and I'm sure people have done, in fact, I know people have done, it's a ferocious conversation that comes out the other side of it. Then you shake hands, and then it's like, okay, you're right. So, I mean, that that's, yeah. I mean, I don't see that on courses for sure. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to upset my A license or pro license edu- uh, assessor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's almost the other way around, isn't it? We almost go towards, you know, agreeing with them so that we get the diploma, so we can get out of there. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> All right, uh, just wrapping up, you, you said that when you wrote about coaching the, the Tiga Taka style of play it was never meant to be a book it was a self-directed research project that involved me being extremely fortunate and speaking to some fantastic football coaches and you mentioned at the start of the interview then how many you know those types of people you spoke to and where that led you uh, just interested to, to to hear if you feel that young coaches today are reluctant to spend the time and going back to the depth and studying a coach or a system or a culture do we wait just for the cliff notes to come out or the YouTube clip to come out? Uh, I don't think it's just young coaches uh, and it's not all coaches, but there are certainly coaches I've worked with or will work with that uh, do that. You know, go on YouTube, find a two minute clip and then that's, oh yeah, this is the best. You know, and, and there's no framework to allow them to align their ideas and thoughts. Um yeah, it's frustrating when you're in that situation and you're working with people like that. But there are, there are people out there, and they're not always young. Some of them are they're older coaches who, who want to learn and have great intentions, but um, flip-flop from idea to idea and will get videos of Barcelona playing and then apply it to their 10-year-old kids. <laughs> um, I mean, that happens for sure, 100%. But I think you, what you're missing out on there, and, and I'll say this with, uh, with all well intentions. So uh, when I used to meet James Nash... There were times where I lived in West Wales and James Nash lives in Milton Keynes. So I'm making a five hour, six hour drive to sit and meet with a man in Starbucks and talk with him for nine hours. Right? Which sounds insane. My mother never understood that. Like she, I'm sure she thinks I'm crazy. But that that drive the, the, the drive, I hate the drive. But the sit down conversation with one Starbucks cut the last nine hours, um, bouncing ideas and letting conversation flow and and just saying, oh, what do you think about this? Or so-and-so believes this. What do you think about it? What have you got to say on this? Or, okay, you said that, but then then uh, Dan Matisha says this. Or uh, Mick Bill says this. What do you think? That conversation and, and developing a layered understanding of different perspectives, uh, of course, it requires a specific area of obsession. But that conversation is is the most changing conversation you can have. And, and, and Nashi is only, I think he's younger than me. He might be a year older or so, but... Nashi, James Nash, um, is the most influential person I've had in, in, in the way I think because of those conversations. Um, and just seeing, okay, there was genuine curiosity there. Uh, and and that, those gray areas between the black and white questions. So we're sitting with Mark Sampson, and I'm asking him questions, trying to pick his brain, and he knows I'm talking about Bielsa, and he knows, or Chris Davis. Um, and again, Chris Davis, I drove across the country to meet him at a, a hotel in, in near London. And Mark Sampson, I met in Swansea, fortunately. Um, he's from that area originally. He used to work for, yeah, she used to work at the academy in Swansea when it was, uh, Roberto Martinez was there and it was just all individual, uh, technical based. Um, he's got a really interesting story, Mark Sampson. But Mark, uh, we'd sit and we'd talk and the, the stuff that happens between the black and white, the, between the question and the direct answer you want, the conversations about, oh, we brought a business guy in and he was talking, or the rugby guys came in and they talked about combat zones. I'm like, what's a combat zone? He was like, oh, you know, it's, it's the zone around where you lose the ball and how many players are in it and do we counter press? Do we drop? I'm like, wow. Like, that's, I've not thought about that before like that. And having that just genuine, and it is genuine, like, I'm not sitting there going, wow, sarcastically, staying genuinely naive in that conversation and genuinely, um, like you don't know anything, dropping everything at the door is, is I mean, you're not going to get that by going to YouTube and or reading Cliff Notes. Uh, so my topic, the first book, was, was Tiki Taka or, or possession, dominance. That was the topic of conversation. That was the area of obsession. But I, 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 don't, I can't remember much about that book now, but so long ago. But I'd imagine if you pick up that book and look through it, and I think I know so, the book just takes these random detours down different rabbit holes. Uh, and again, the Bielsa book, 
you know, I'm having conversations with people, former players who've worked under him, you know, different coaches who've worked under him or worked under people who worked under him, you know, and worked back. That's why it's called In Shadows of Marcelo Bielsa because I unfortunately mm-hmm. could never get hold of the guy. But the rabbit holes you go down, the conversation are amazing. I mean, those are the bits where you just, you plug everything you know together and you're like, this is what a conversation that was. And James Nash, I made that drive five or six times for, you know, because every single time I was like, and I I couldn't tell you, like a phone call doesn't do it justice. It's it's the most amazing conversation to have. And I just wish I had more people in my life. And I'm sure there are many people out there like yourself, Gary, uh, that you can have these conversations with and reach new milestones with. Brilliant, brilliant. All right, last one for you. The best revi- advice you would have for mm. for a younger for a young coach and you kind of touched upon it there about kind of going going away and getting uh experiences um there's so many young people today i think jed want to be tactical experts and want to see the game through the same lens as you see the game well, how do you, what's the process that you would advise them to do that yeah i think it's uh sort of what i was saying then about role modeling yourself off of people who show genuine curiosity and authenticity before anything else. I have a genuine engagement and excitement and conversation um, and, and can sit and have a conversation with you and not just go, oh, I think this, I think this, but offer genuine, genuine building blocks to the way you think. You know, people who can sit there, get into how you think about it and go, okay, this is their perspective. This is their view on the game. Okay, what can I plug onto that? What can I throw at him to make him think about it? I know Ben Bartlett back home, back in England, brilliant at that. I, I speak to Fulham coaches every now and again. They always talk about how amazing he is. That He comes in as a, a mentor for the club and the academy coaches and doesn't come in and say, oh, you're doing it wrong. or it's not right. This is not right. But speaks to them in a way that allows them to put building blocks onto the way they're working and the way they're thinking. Uh, and what I would say, so it's difficult just to give advice, but the, to not replicate anyone else or anyone else's ideas or sessions or coaching personality, um, and be truly authentic and curious in what you're doing. I think, and it's easier said than done, but finding other people like that, you know, and, and then start, and I try to do it here in Ottawa. It's tough because like you spoke about young coaches who want to go on YouTube, but just set up some sort of young coach community where we can just sit and not even have a beer with something. You can have a beer if you want, but I'm trying not to drink, but just have a, have a water and sit there and just have this amazing conversation for two hours, you know, um, uh, there was a there was a quote, and I, I remember writing it down. Oh, rubbish with quotes today, but it was like, uh, if you give a, a give a person an answer, all he gains is a little fact. But you give him a question, a way of questioning, he'll look for a lifetime of answers. And I think that's that that bit there. Like if you can get in that mindset and get two or three others also in that mindset, set up a little regular meeting, you've got something special. And not many people, I don't think, do that. Everyone works in their own little island mm. or within their own club with the same drum being beat the whole time. Um, but yeah, that would be my advice to try and set that sort of community up somewhere where it's face-to-face meetings and it's, it's about that. And get, leave the complaining about everyone else at the door. Don't even go in with one complaint. Oh, this club's doing this or oh, look at that. Like, just leave that at the door. You, you gain very little with that. Different class. Jed, I can't thank you enough for, I, I just looked at my watch there about five minutes ago and thank God we've only got a couple of minutes left. So this is just oh, well. blown through. So Thank you so much for your, your time and your insight. Um, no worries. I hope that was good. Thanks so much to Jed for taking the time to talk. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Time absolutely flew there for me, as I said. Uh, the topic of decision-making is one that I personally could listen to people like Jed discuss all day. And I think even recently the World Cup has shown that the players, the top, top players making the right decision at the right time um, it's now even extended to both sides of the ball. I think this tournament, I noticed more than anything, is that the margin of error in decision making is so small, and and these teams that are competing at the final stage, the latter stages of the tournament, their their defensive systems are even with fatigue, even with extra time, the players' ability to deliver the right decisions and to stick in the discipline to commit to those decisions for 90 plus minutes, 110 minutes plus penalties, whatever it is, outstanding. So really interested in how we can improve that as coaches because I think there's a lot of work we can do with that there. And and Jed going into different areas and different books that he's looking at um, is an absolute inspiration to how we should be looking for it as coaches. And then his advice at the end of the podcast and, and getting out and almost creating 
learning moments yourselves, which for young coaches, you know, we, we look at coaching courses and, you know, getting to watch other coaches work, but even just asking them for a coffee and sitting down with people who you can learn from and going from there and, and keep doing it and being intentional about who you ask and how you conduct yourself and the right questions you ask during it. I think, again, that it's going to become a skill for coaches. I think uh, getting mentors and getting people who can who can challenge your thinking and advance your thinking, I think is going to be someone that, that can take coaches to another level. So thanks so much to Jed. We'd love to get him on again. And as soon as the podcast was over, he was shooting me messages with people who he felt could add more to the topic of player development and keep the conversation going. So again, humility, giving back, it shows just how much he cares about the coaching community and how passionate he is about learning and, and getting us all better and, and help driving the conversation forward. So um, I was thrilled to hear from him and, and hopefully we can keep this conversation going for sure on the player development aspect. So thanks so much to Jed. Thanks for listening. Uh, please, before you before you shoot off for the day, please just uh, let me know what you thought. Uh, a tweet, a little post on Instagram, at Gary Carino on both. Always good to hear from coaches and see what, what they enjoyed um, and what they would like a little bit more of. So thanks so much. I appreciate you taking the time and we'll talk to you very soon. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. For more coaching topics, sessions and resources head on over to coach kernine on facebook or visit the website at www.modernsoccercoach.com